All right, let's get into the message. Now, I, I explained last week, or I think it was on Sunday, what I was going to be preaching today. And then yesterday in Iola, I began um, kind of like part one of this message, if you will. And it has a little bit to do with just uh, the ideas that are out there concerning, you know, the worldview. When you look around, how did things get here? They're... they're understanding of those things. And yesterday in Iola, what I pointed out is the word religion. Religion's become kind of a bad word. Like even Christians are like, you know, it's, it's not a religion, it's a relationship and, and all this. But yeah, but James talks about, a tr you know, tr pure religion is what? Visiting the widows and the fatherless and their affliction and keeping yourself unspotted from the world. And what he's saying there, I believe, is that, hey, your action is going to show what your belief system is, right? Your belief system is going to be based on who your final authority and what your religion is. And so you can't separate religion from your worldview and how you understand the world, and thus affecting what your actions are, okay? And so I think that is the root of some of the things uh, that we have in our, in our culture today. And I preached on that yesterday. I'm not going to preach that, but that leads up to... Uh, what I'm talking about today. Now, somebody sent me an article at the beginning of all this and where all this got started. Somebody sent me this article talking about a new discovery they found. November 7th is when this article came out, and it says that they discovered fossils of a duck-billed dinosaur, okay, uh, called Angnabia, Angnabia, okay, Duck-billed dinosaur, about the size of a pony, I think they said. It's one of the smaller of the dinosaurs. And the interesting thing, what made this such a, such a special discovery, is that they found it in Africa. Okay? And so they said, well, wait a minute. This uh, was something that, was, uh, that evolved in North America. And we all know that there was no way for them to get from North America to Africa, and so they're really uh, trying to figure out how it got there. Started in North America, branched down to South America, ended up in Africa. They just found these fossils in Africa, and they said, well, how did they get there? Because according to their timeline, which I'm not going to get into, you know, uh, some, of the, some of their theories about this, but according to their timeline, there was a continental drift, however many hundreds of thousands of years ago, Right? And then they know that these dinosaurs had to have been alive at this certain time. And this, so they're saying there's no way that they could have got that. And so the conclusion they came to, the only explanation is that they somehow swam, you know, from Africa to, I mean, from uh, South America or North America, whichever, somewhere from this, this region to Africa. They had to swim or float on a raft or whatever. And this isn't anything new because they say the exact same thing for how monkeys ended up in North America or South America. They say they swam or they surfed or floated on rafts or whatever from Africa. And that's the only explanation. Where's their source for that? Well, here's kind of interesting in this article that I'm reading. Here's who they quote as a source. Sherlock Holmes said, <laughs> that's a joke, okay? He's a, he's a fictional character. Sherlock Holmes said, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, probable must be the truth. All right. And then he says it was impossible for uh, to for the, these guys to walk to Africa. And so it's it's this mindset. Hey, just eliminate the impossible, and whatever's left is possible. And it's interesting to me uh, the absurd things that scientists and experts will believe. Now, let me, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I believe even the study of uh, textual criticism and the modern day scholars who believe that the King James isn't right and they got to correct it and modern translators, all that stuff. Do you know they use the same types of reasoning? You know, they're like, well, you know, that just seems impossible. There's no way somebody could have accidentally translated it like that. So it must be right. <laughs> I mean, that's really like there's just, and it's absurd. Some things uh, that people will believe, and yet they'll reject the Bible. They'll reject what the Bible says, not give that an option. No, we got to figure out something out contrary to the Bible. And that's been going on forever. 
You know, that's been going on. We were studying on the way up here. I was trying to refresh my mind and some things about uh, the evolution, I mean, the uh, yeah, theories of evolution and all that. And actually, you can trace that all the way back to Aristotle, right? And probably before, the, before him, some people were thinking of ways to explain our existence here without God. And so, uh, you know, you got the Greeks and the philosophers of that day, you know, trying to find some kind of new enlightenment and figure out an explanation contrary to what uh, God's Word says. And so that's nothing new. All right. What is so improbable about these creatures swimming from one continent to the other continent? Well, here's the thing. The closest place. Now, I don't know how fast uh, the continents are drifting. I mean, at some point, are they going to run into each other on the other side of the earth? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but right now, presently, what's so absurd about this is what they and what this article fails to mention is that journey would be 321 kilometers, which is 1,877 uh, uh, miles that that creature had to swim in order to get here. But you can't stop and think of there's a possible other explanation. No, because we know our model's right. we got to find something fit. Well, let me just tell you, first of all, that's not science. That's not how science works. You don't just make it fit. Your, you have to go with the observable uh, facts. And so uh, anyway, to put that into perspective, Michael Phelps, can swim six miles an hour, all right? So if Michael Phelps could swim at his top speed all the way from Africa or from uh, South America to Africa, uh, he would have to travel for 312 hours or 13 days at that speed, all right? Now, I don't know if these dinosaurs would have been eating fish on the way or, <laughs> or what, but that's a long time to swim and to go with that. And then I don't know if they found just one, a fossil of one animal or several animals, but more than one had to make it for them to be able to uh, live for any length of time. So anyway, the, so this got me thinking about the absurdities that people will believe and yet reject the Bible. And so the title of the message tonight is Willingly Ignorant. We just read from 2nd Peter, but it's called Willingly Ignorant, or a subtitle would be The Absurdities of Science Falsely So-Called. He just read 2 Peter, look again at verse uh, chapter 3, verse 5, it says, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth, standing out of the water and in the water. So the two things that we can expect people to reject, who want to reject God's word, right? They're going to reject, first of all, that everything that was created was created by God's Word. We understand that just by reading the first book of the Bible, the first chapter, the first verse. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then you read uh, John 1, and we see that in the beginning was the Word, you know, and he talks about him all things being created by Him. So we know that God spoke into existence everything that's here. Oh, that's too hard to believe. Well, there's a lot of stuff out there that's hard to believe, but you're going to believe it if you want to, <laughs> right? The second thing is that the verse uh, 6 there talks about whereby, it's talking about the earth standing in the water, out of the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. second thing that they deny is the, the catastrophic event that happened in Noah's flood. The Bible makes it clear about these two things. We believe these, we accept my faith. And the interesting thing is, if you believe the Bible and you observe our word, our world, knowing the word of God, what you're going to see as you look at the evidence, you're going to filter it through God's Word and you're going to say, huh, how did this get here? Well, God created it. Maybe He created it with age. That's what I believe as you read Genesis. It looks like He created everything with the appearance of age, right? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, the chicken. It looked like a full-grown chicken, right? He created with age and He created the whole earth that way, I believe. But not only that, events happen uh, a couple thousand years later. It was flood and there's a catastrophe that happened that changed the face of the earth. So you look at something and say, wow, how did that happen? Well, it was either millions and millions of years or it happened instantly in the flood. And it's interesting as you read some of these things, uh, uh, they will talk about, you know, how the only way this could happen is some landslide must have happened and things must have been preserved. And when I was studying about the 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 uh, soft tissue in the dinosaur's bones, and I talked about that last week. Uh, when I was talking about that, it said that there, had, there was like some landslide, and they must have 
been really quickly, you know, just covered by this mud or something like that for it to be preserved. Well, that's pretty much evidence when I'm thinking, because of my worldview, based on my religion, which is a Bible-believing Christian, uh, I believe, hey, there was a catastrophe, Noah's flood. That doesn't, that doesn't puzzle me one bit. But they're going to try to look for everything that they can to, uh, to explain things their way. So willingly ignorant, that's what he says uh, in, uh, in 2 Peter 3. Look at 1 Timothy 6, another familiar passage, I'm sure. You know where I'm going here, First uh, Timothy 6. And let's look at verse 20. He says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. So the full title is Willingly Ignorant, the absurdities of science falsely so called. What's science? Now, I'm a fan of science. I'm not saying I'm good at it. I'm not saying I didn't just barely pass in high school <laughs> through my science classes. But I'm interested in science. If you read scientific journal, you read something like that. I think those things are interesting. I like looking at nature, being in nature, uh, geology, and all these different things are interesting to me. And so uh, the, the here's some forms of science, okay, some branches of science. There's formal science. Praise the Lord for these people, okay? Mathematicians, right? People who study logic, people who study uh, statistics. I, I just I just can't do it. I just can't do it. That's not, <laughs> that's not my field of study by any means, right? Uh, this uh, formal science. Computer science. Praise the Lord for people like Brother David, amen? <laughs> I can't do it. I remember talking to him one time, and he's like, He's like, I don't understand how people can use computers and all this and not question, like, how does this work? Like, how do I get this information? How do I get that? And I'm thinking, yeah, I never really thought much about it. <laughs> Just push the button and boom, it's on, right? But by the same token, you talk to people that are, I was just talking about to Brother Nick about this while we were so when You talk to people in their 50s, and they, it's like they've never really thought about eternal life. They've never really thought about what they got to do to get to heaven. You're like, how could you go through this whole world? Not wondering what's going to happen after I die. I don't understand, right? But anyway, there's some people that are interested in this field of science, and it's called a formal science. There's also natural science. I'm a little more interested in this. Physical science, which has to do with physics and the study of atoms and all that, or, or geology, geology, when you study rocks and rock structures and the seafloor, you know, they got marine biology and uh, there's, there's a, well, that's life science. Life science studies uh, life, obviously. That's bio, biology and, and uh, microbiology, botany, the study of plants, uh, zoology. I love studying animals. So interesting. So interesting, all the things. And you really want to like a marvel. Like, I think God created the platypus just to like trip up the evolutionists, <laughs> right? The platypus is crazy, man. This is a mammal. But it has, but it lays eggs, right? And it swims in the water, but it's got fur, and it, uh, and it's got a duck bill, and it's got like I don't know. There's several other things that it just it's mysteries, right? It's just really tripped them up, and I think God just kind of created that thing to just trip people up. But science, I, I enjoy science. There's social science. I actually enjoy this. This is studying people, right? Anthropology and and social behavior and stuff like that. Studying and even a little bit of psychology is involved in there. Although most psychology today is not science at all. Okay, uh, uh, anthropology, all those kind. Of, these are science, and science simply means what? You guys probably know, huh? Someone said it. Knowledge. Science is is it just means knowledge to know something. Think about being uh, conscience. Uh, your conscience, right? That's actually kind of more about knowing good and evil or something, but, or, or conscious, same, same root word, all right? I'm conscious means I'm knowing. I, I have knowledge. I understand. And so this is the idea. The study of something, learning something, getting to know that is called science. And so the Bible talks about that a few times. It uses the word science, science, and it's talking about people who just know things. They understand different things. Understanding how things work, understanding the world around us, trying to figure it all out. There's nothing wrong with that. That's good. And I don't even mind people saying, like, I don't understand. Let me throw this weird theory out there, you know. 
How did these bones get here? I don't care if people want to throw some weird theories out there. That's not my point of reading this article. My point is that they'll accept the most absurd things and then just reject that there's a creator. Yep. You know, and it's just, uh, and this is what we're going to talk about tonight. So look at Romans 1. Romans 1. The problem is that the experts today that we know or we or or the the world as a whole seems to look to for their knowledge the experts for the most part have tried to remove religion from their education from their field of study and uh and you can't do that okay you and this is the message that I preached yesterday you cannot remove religion from your world view you just can't so when they try to do that other things become their religion and other things become their God. And you know who their God usually is? Themselves, right? They're their, they're their own God. And they study the world through their uh, what they want to believe, and so they're their own God. Or education is their God. And the, 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 uh, uh, um, the teachers and the, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, professors and all that that come and teach in the class, they're their gods, right? Whoever they read in these books, these are their gods. Education becomes their religion, okay? Whatever the case, but most of the time, people itself is their god, all right? And here's what the Bible says, Romans 1, look at verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now what's the Bible say? Without faith it's impossible to please God. You say, well, I would believe God if I could just see the evidence. No, you wouldn't. And God knows that. And so he left just enough evidence so that those people who believe would be like, it's obvious to me. And just as, uh, as little evidence that the doubters would say, prove it to me. Right? <laughs> For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. <clears throat> Even uh, his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse." Right? The evidence is there. It's just not enough to convince them. They're looking for more evidence, and, uh, and they reject the little bit that they have. So here's what it says, verse 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. I love how it starts that all out. Paul says, look, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I go out, preach the gospel. People might say, ah, I don't reject, I reject that. They might scoff at you and say, that's silly. Don't you believe in science? Well, yeah, I do believe in science. But I also believe in the Word of God. And, and I view science through my worldview, which is uh, the Word of God. And if they reject that, you know, they're, they're making something else their God. And they'll believe all kinds of weird things. So here are some of the absurdities of uh, this willingly ignorant crowd who teaches science falsely so-called. Okay, I'm just going to look at two basic you know, these are the big, the big things here. <clears throat> One is the creation of the world, obviously. And the other is the end of the world. The end of the world. Uh, look at Revelation 6. We'll start with the end of the world, and then we'll look at creation. Look at Revelation chapter 6. Here's what we believe. Because we believe the Bible... We read this and we say, hey, this time is coming. And here is how a large portion of the earth is going to be destroyed. Look at verse 5, Revelation 6, verse 5. 
And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I saw the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And, the pow and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. All right? Now, we're going through Revelation, the study of Revelation on Sundays, and we've already talked about this and the idea of the beast coming up and, and the mark of the beast and people needing to worship uh, the dragon and, and uh, the mark, mark of the beast. We have, we, we're kind of right there. We haven't talked real in depth about it. But we understand these things. We know they're coming. We see that, and we look at this, and the end result of all these things is that there's going to be all these people who die. And this is just this is just part of it, okay? This is part of all the mass death that's on this earth. Now, right now, there are there's close to 8 billion people in this world. So let's say this is talking about the population, and it's growing. So I would suspect, you know, if this if the, these events don't happen really, really soon, it'll be at least 8, 8 billion. So let's say a fourth, let's say that's talking about population. And let's say a fourth of the population dies in a world war. How many people is that? A fourth of, of 8 billion? That's about 2 billion people. That's a, that's a pretty big amount of people who are going to die, right? And yet, uh, we believe that, and people think we're crazy for believing that. But then if you read articles from the world, they will talk about all these people that are going to die if we don't do this and if we don't do that. And, uh, and, you know, one of the big things right now, of course, is, man, if you don't wear the mask and, and shut yourself up indoors and all that, you know, more people are going to die. And I don't know how many people they're predicting are going to die and all that. Um, and so these are the kind of things you hear. But here's what the Bible talks about. It talks about all these people being dying in this world war. And then there's famine. People are going to die during that famine. And stay with us in our Revelation series. But after we're raptured out of here, what happens? We've already talked about this, actually, I guess. The judgment of God upon the earth. You got fire coming down from heaven. and You got hail. You got, uh, you got at what we would call acts of God. We've got uh, 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 catastrophes happen. There's uh, stars falling, which are probably talking about asteroids. And they're falling, hitting the earth. You got water being polluted. All these kinds of things at the hand of God. And yet, what did the world scientists today say? And by the way, they think the Bible's foolish. If you try to tell them, whoa, 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 there's some events going on in this world today that are leading up to what we see in the book of Revelation, and I don't think that we should uh, embrace these things uh, because this is what the Bible says is going to happen. They say, that's ridiculous. What are you talking about? Just live life as normal. right? And then you turn around and you read an article written by them, and they say, don't you know the world's coming to an end? Right? Because you guys keep polluting the world. <laughs> Your world's going to come to an end because you guys keep drinking out of plastic straws. <laughs> There's some weird stuff going on, man. Uh, California legalized what? Pretty much any drugs? I don't know. They, cocaine? Oh, it's Oregon. I'm sorry. Yeah, Oregon is, is legalizing cocaine, all this stuff. And then you got people making straws illegal. Right? I saw this meme that said, that must really stink. Cocaine's legal and straws are illegal anyway. That's a, <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> but you got some weird things going on in this world. You got people who are activists standing up saying, you know, you remember that little girl? Everybody forgot about her now, but how dare you? Whatever. She became an activist, right? She just wanted something to fight for. I'm going to get to that in a minute. And she got this, uh, these teachings you know, that she learned in public school or whatever. And she said, man, this is the cause that I need to stand up for and I need to fight. And she began to uh, to go on this, just, I don't know who was influencing her or putting her up in front of the public, but she was, you know, condemning all of the older folks for letting our world die, you know, while uh, her generation's not going to be able to make it or whatever. And what's she talking about? Pollution. 
things like this. And she's saying, if we're not careful, uh, you know, we are going to destroy our world through pollution. Now, one, one place you can look up, if you want to know what the world thinks right now, the climate of the world, you're going to have to, you're going to look something up on Google, okay? Because Google is censoring anything right now that doesn't line up with their agenda. I am not kidding. You look anything up, you're hard pressed to find anything that doesn't fit their, their agenda, okay? And it's not just Google, but let's just start there because that is where a lot of people get their information. Now, if you look up uh, certain things in Google, uh, well, no, you don't have to look it up, all right? You just get ready to type on the search engine. And I don't know, it was a couple weeks ago, I looked on there and, uh, and it was like transgender awareness week or something like that. I mean, every, it seems like every other week they got something like that where they're just praising some kind of thing that goes against the Bible. But today it says something like, uh, okay, so I go get ready to make a Google search and this little leaf falls down on the page and he gets down to the bottom and it says carbon neutral since 2004. Well, what's carbon neutral mean? Well, there was this idea entertained a while back. We're destroying the earth by our carbon footprint, right? When every time you burn fossil fuels, every time you do certain things, you're, uh, there was a time when I was a kid, if you used hairspray, they said you're burning a hole in the ozone layer. I think that's, I don't think they're saying that anymore, but I don't know. <laughs> And they're saying, like, you're destroying the earth by your pollution. Hey, when I was a kid, they had, for a cartoon that kids would watch, Captain Planet. Anybody know Captain Planet? <laughs> I think he was blue, if I remember right. And he had a green mullet. I'm not kidding. This was a superhero, Captain Planet. He had a green mullet, and he was, I think, blue. And, you, you know, the, the, the cartoon would start, and it's Captain Planet. He's our hero. It's really tacky. And so, and then there's these kids, and they all got the power of earth, wind, fire, and, and all these things. I mean, that's like, by the way, that's like witchcraft. <laughs> okay. And uh, the elements all combined. And it's like, by our, by our power combined, you know, uh, then they make Captain Planet or something. I can't remember how it went. And so, and guess who the enemy always was? The enemy in that show was always, and it's kind of like this in movies and stuff today, too. Always the people that are cutting down trees. Those are enemies. Those are the people that need to die. Always the people that are like uh, drilling for oil or something like that, and they're killing natural habitats. And <laughs> These were the enemies, right? Because they're harming our earth. And as Christians, we're like, you know what? We look at Revelation. We know what the end of the earth looks like, and we're still around. <laughs> we don't have a say over these things that are going to happen it's already written down. God's going to bring these judgments upon the earth. We don't have to worry about these things. Okay. And here's what they say. Okay. If we don't destroy, if we're able to save that, if we can get in the right politician, which by the way, if Biden's in, which it looks like he's going to be in and from my, from everything I can see, but then again, Google's giving us all of our information. <laughs> and, uh, everything I can see looks like he's going to be in. And if Biden's in, you can guarantee you're going to start hearing more about this global warming than you have in the last four years. Okay. And, uh, and if, but if you get the right man in and he fights against pollution, he charges these wicked people that are, that are, you know, have this big carbon footprint or whatever. They're not carbon, carbon neutral. And if, uh, if we can get that, our hero in there, Captain Planet, and he can uh, save us from this and we can live a little bit longer. Well, then we need to start preparing for an asteroid that's probably going to hit. Because this is what they say. Eventually, an asteroid is going to hit. It's inevitable. And it's going to hit us. And uh, after all, that's how the, di the dinosaurs went extinct 64 million years ago. We just know. It was a, we just know it was, a, it was a comet that, I mean, an asteroid that fell and uh, destroyed there. So here, here's what Wikipedia, talking about end of the world views that are out there, okay, that are popular. It says this, asteroids with a one kilometer or, uh, or 0.62 mile diameter strike Earth every 500,000 years on average. Large collisions with five kilometer or three mile uh, objects happen approximately once every 20 million years. The last known impact of an object of 10 kilometers or six miles or more in diameter was at the Crustaceous Paleogene extinction event 66 million years ago. <laughs> so 
Give it a few million years and it's inevitable. Another one's going to hit. OK, <laughs> so what do we got to do? And this is I'm not kidding. What do we have to do? So here's what we need to do. We need to prepare for this. And so we need to start setting uh, uh, getting space programs in place so we can uh, make a habitation on Mars or some other planet because we might not be around. I mean, never mind the fact that Mars gets hit with asteroids and all these other planets get hit with asteroids too. But we got to start looking for somewhere because our Earth is going to be destroyed eventually. Right? This is what they'll believe or teach. But whenever you tell them, well, yeah, actually, I do know that an asteroid is going to hit Earth. God's going to send it as judgment. And it's going to hit and it's going to wipe out a third of the Earth. And it's going to poison the water. And it's going to, and this is what the Bible says in Revelation. They're going to say, ha, ha, you believe that thing? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I believe the elements are going to burn with a fervent heat, just like the Bible says. But here's what the, okay, let me, let me address that. Now, if we can stop that, we need to prepare for the burning up of our sun. You know that eventually science tells us that the sun, it can't burn forever. I mean, it's only burned for however many billions of years that they say it's been out there. We know it's, we know it's less than that, but this is what they say. Eventually, the thing's got to burn out. I'm thinking, yes, yeah, shouldn't it have burned out by now by your, <laughs> by your measurements? Okay, but they think, well, we better plan for that. You know, it might be another five billion years, but we better start plan <laughs> planning now. That thing might burn out. Man, we're going to have to figure out a way to keep civilization going. And the list goes on and on. I'm just scratching the surface, but these bizarre things that they'll embrace or they'll ponder and this is how science works they throw some radical idea out there and try to you know see if it if it holds up you know and if they can get it to hold up then it must be fact you right i was looking into the uh, there are people uh most people have embraced evolution for instance as fact and not theory i was always taught it was the theory of evolution some people say it's not even a theory it's still in the hypothesis stage Others will say, no, it's a proven, it's observable fact. Well, it is observable that different uh, adaptations and changes within species, I, I believe that's observable fact. But what nobody has ever observed is a, is a monkey turning into a human being. <laughs> Nobody's observed a monkey swimming across, across the ocean for, for uh, 2,000 uh, miles either, <laughs> right? Nobody's ever observed those things, yet they think those are true because of they're trying to put together an explanation for the evidence that they see. Well, our worldview is based on the Bible, and so it all fits. I mean, I am never surprised when something comes out. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of what the Bible said was going to happen. But the world thinks that it's foolish. Okay, so let's move on to the second part, which is the beginning of the world. And this is what we mostly here talked about. And I'm actually not even going to spend a whole lot of time on this. Uh, one, because I haven't done enough study to see what all the different theories are out there of the Big Bang and all that kind of stuff. I'm not really all that <laughs> that interested in, in these theories. But, you know, really just the thought of the Big Bang. I mean, I remember as a little kid just thinking like, How, what do you say? So where did that little speck come from? right that everything supposedly just it was all there and then it just where did that come from and so like i always wondered like because they they there are people that will teach that literally you know everything here came from nothing right there was nothing and then there was something and someone say well it wasn't really nothing it was just this really small thing like smaller than the pin of a needle and everything in the universe was basically existed in that and then it I don't understand that. I don't I, I don't I don't really care to look much into it, but I think that's absurd. Yep. Okay? And I think it's absurd to just start speculating that things could come uh from nothing. And then you say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't you think it looks like we had a creator?" You know, for years people use the whole thing about the if you look at a watch, you know, you know that it was a creator and it wasn't like some uh explosion. Uh I can't even remember how the how the saying goes, there's lots of them, right? Uh, you know, uh, you, you, you don't, you don't, you just look at that and you know, hey, that is definitely a creator that made that. Then you look at the, at the um, intricacies of the body, the human body. How could anybody just think that just all came into to being, you know, billions and billions of years. That's the only way we just, if we put enough years, people can't fathom how long that is. And, uh, and, and it makes sense, right? 
So they got to have that, that billions of billions of years. And it's just, it's just absurd. So, you know, I remember as a kid thinking, well, look, everything goes back. Something, it had to have always existed. It can't come from nothing. That's about the most unscientific thing that you could ever say. Had to come from something. And so people will say, well, yeah, sure. Well, there, were, there was something around. I mean, uh, there was a force. There was, a, you know, an energy. There was some kind of a matter that existed, right, that is just always there. Well, look, if anything was always there, right, uh, it was um, eternal. If anything was eternal, we're talking about God. <laughs> That's the only uh, explanation. Anything eternal is talking about God just because you can't explain Him. Uh, this doesn't mean he's not God. But here's what they'll say. They'll, 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 I'm not kidding. These are, these are guys that are supposed to be teaching science in school. And here's what they'll say. Well, it is possible that a higher life form, you know, that evolved somewhere else, however many years ago, actually got to the point where they could actually create human life. And they put us here on earth. And so, we, you know, we, there was a higher life form that created us. But it wasn't God. It was something that evolved. I mean, they will not acknowledge God. And that's what Romans 1 said. <laughs> and they became foolish, right? And Second Peter says that they were willingly ignorant. And so now they're teaching what Second Timothy said, science falsely so-called. And it's absurd when you listen to some of these kinds of things. Some people will say we don't really exist. I remember watching uh, Matt Powell's, uh, I think it was on the science falsely so-called documentary, where he talked to the guy that was saying, well, you know, we all could just be in someone's basement, part of like a reality program <laughs> or something like that. Did you did you ever hear that that quote? It's ridiculous what they will believe and yet reject the Bible. And so uh, and so we look at all that. I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to keep going on this ideas about the beginning of the world. But you understand the absurdity that's there. But the conclusion is this, that people are going to believe what they want to believe, okay? So let me tell you about people. This includes us, by the way. As Christians, we're not void of this, okay? Here, here are some things that all people have in common, all right? We want to do what pleases our God, right? We want to do what pleases our God. Now, the problem is that most people, their God is not the God of the Bible, right? And in most cases, their God is themselves, right? So here's what Philippians, I'll read it. Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 through 19 says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. Doesn't that sound like most of the people walking around today? Their God's just their belly. What can I do to consume it upon my lust? You know, what can I get do to get what I want out of life? And then it says that their end is destruction, their glory is their shame. But it's true. We want to please our God. But as Christians, our God needs to be the God of, of the Bible, the God that we, we know only by faith in his word. And that will, you know, that will put things into perspective and we will do what pleases our God. It's just we're not our own God, okay? Number two, we want to be on a team of people who agree with us, don't we? We want other people to agree with us. This is one reason it should behoove us to preach the gospel. Man, we want people to be one to our side. We win them. We're winning them to Christ, but we win them to an understanding to think like us. This is why it's hard to even be in a church where people aren't like-minded, even if they've got salvation right. If they're teaching other things contrary to what your way of thinking, you're like, man, I want to be part of a team that believes like me. This is normal. Okay? So the world and those that we read about in Romans 1 are seeking the same thing. Romans 1, 32 says, Who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. It's not good enough just that they do it. You know, they want to see other people who are doing the same things. They want to watch it on TV, people that are doing what they do. They want to uh, win other people and uh, convert them to their side where they do uh, what they do. And I'm telling you, what is the point of, an, of a militant atheist? I mean, they're everywhere. If you go online for any length of time, talking about Christianity, they're out there, these militant atheists that want to convert you 
to atheism. What does it matter to them? <laughs> when this life is over, I mean, this is it. That's all they got. Why do they have to go out there and spend their whole life evangelizing the world to their religion of atheism? What is the point, right? But it is because they want people on their side. And the last is this. We want to have a purpose. This is why one of the reasons those militant atheists, we want to have a purpose in life. But that purpose is always going to fit our worldview. So why do people become activists? All right. Uh, I think, again, of that little girl, uh, Gre Greta or whatever. What is it? Greta, how dare you? You know, she's just an activist and she's going to follow whatever the left wing people are telling her. And, hey, this is fun. And so you feed somebody who we know this human nature. You want to be. You want to be, have purpose in life. And so you feed these kids in high school with an agenda. And by the way, most of the teachers, a, a big portion of the teachers out there are liberal. And, and I would even go as far as to say God haters. And for some reason, they went into that field to be able to pollute children's minds. I mean, I really believe that. And so they're in there and they're teaching them all kinds of garbage. And they're, they're giving them a purpose for their life. And they come out as the um, activists, okay? So what are some things that they give them? Hey, we got to save the world. We got to save the world, all right? All these people out there are destroying the world with their pollution, right? This is what my generation grew up. Uh, you got to save the whales, free willy. <laughs> you know, you got to save, you got to save the planet, Captain Planet. You got to, I mean, this is, this is the way I grew up, okay? Uh, the bad guy in all the movies was always somebody cutting down trees or, or uh, polluting uh, the seas or something like that. Okay, and so they give these people this, this purpose in life. Spend all your money, your resources, your time, your effort to stop the, save the animals, you know. Go to the animal shelters. We don't want those animals to die. Stop the hunters, right? They're killing all these innocent deer. No, these deer are killing people jumping in front of their cars. <laughs> they need to be shot, <laughs> all right? Anybody want an agenda? I'll give you an agenda. <laughs> <laughs> so these people are given something to fight for because they want purpose in their life. We got to save the trees. We got to save the animals. I can't tell you how many funerals I've been to where the memorial money that comes in at that funeral goes to some kind of animal rescue, save the animals. They think, well, the last thing I want to do, you know, on my die on my deathbed is to just make sure that some organization gets my money that can save some animals. How many people have you knocked on the door and said, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? Well, I've been good. I've, I've rescued animals. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, people have been given this as part of their worldview. They've, they've, they've been taught this and, and, and it's become something, it's become a purpose to them, something that they want to get behind. We all want to have a purpose. Let me get, let me get a little more up to date here. <clears throat> Here's all we got to do in our public schools. We got to teach kids that all the police officers all the, and all the white people are, hate black people and they're killing black people. And if you can convince these high schoolers that, they'll see the world as a wicked white men that just want to kill black people. It's out there, man. This is what's being taught to kids today. So if you look around at all the Black Lives Matters, I mean, how many of them are these white, liberal, left-wing kids that are just running around with Molotov cocktails throwing them and starting car fires and busting out windows. And why are they doing it? Well, let's be honest. The reason they're doing it is because they want a purpose in life. They want something to fight for. They want something to do. And it sounds like a good thing because black lives do matter, okay? And so it sounds like a good thing, and they want to get behind it. And we certainly don't want anybody to be shot, right? So all of a sudden, the police officer becomes the bad guy, and, every, and he's out to kill everybody. And if we can just convince them that, then they'll give their lives to this cause, even if it means getting shot, right? They will, uh, they'll try to beat people up with their skateboards even so that they can save, you know, a black life. And it's just, the absurdity is the same crowd is for abortion. Yeah. Who do you think the most people that are being aborted are? I mean, look it up. You know, it's lower class people. Uh, not just black people, it's just lower class, like low income type people. But I'm going to tell you that affects a lot of black people, which means a lot of black babies are being killed by abortion. You know, And if you study the history of abortion, I don't have to tell you this, but that's partly why it was started. Look it up if you don't believe me. 
Or let me switch it around now to the right wingers. All right. Here's what you need. You need a purpose in life. You're going to have to fight socialism. <laughs> our country is being taken over by socialism. We need to get our life. We need to give our lives to politics. We need to get our Republican president in and we got to do this. And I'm telling you, people that even claim to be Christians have made politics their God or politics their religion and whatever president they want in their God. And you look at Facebook and everything, and I want to throw up whenever I see them just talking. These are Christians, and they're literally saying things like, if so-and-so doesn't get in, our world's going to come to an end. <laughs> I'm like, you just, you just sound just as bad as the guys who write these kind of articles <laughs> about the dinosaurs. You're just making stuff up to fit your agenda, to fit your worldview, because you want something to fight for. Well, as Christians, it's true. We've got a worldview. We want to please our God. We want to be on a team of people that agree with us. And we want a purpose for our life. But our purpose must be based on the Bible. Let's read 2 Peter again. This is where our religion and our worldview comes from. Don't be confused with the whole... It's, a, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. What did I say? Okay, 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me read this again, starting in verse 11. Now, this is the chapter that said, hey, we know the things that are going to happen at the end. Uh, let me just back up. In fact, let's go to this, uh, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance." And this is what our God stands for. And this is the purpose that he's given us, right? But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Look at verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements uh, shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's our purpose. This is our, our religion. This is our worldview, is that we want to see souls saved, earth is going to end, but we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for the reminder, the, the uh, encouragement that we uh, don't have to fear the destruction of this earth, but, uh, but we look for a new heaven and a new earth, and we seek to please you and uh, help us not to uh, get mixed up with our God being our own belly and our own desires and going after what we want, but help us stay focused on what you've called us to. Help us uh, not get distracted with the evidence that the world tries to bring up uh, to, uh, to convert us to their religion, but help us to understand that all those things are clearly explained in your word and that we accept them by faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please you, Lord. Help us to, uh, to just... Be patient and long-suffering and endure in these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.